Yeah, thanks, John. Um, so, aloha, welcome. Uh, so, as John said, I'm Andy Waffer. I am a lobotomized engineer uh, at ARM. Um, do not trust any code you see from me uh, if it's within the last mm, 10 years. Uh, it's not safe. Uh, so, um, ARM and the uh, Damon, um, how have we realized FreeBSD's value uh, in the real world? So, a little bit of history. Uh, I've been with ARM now for 12 years. Um, and kind of as soon as I landed at ARM, one of the first things I took on was engaging the FreeBSD community. Up until that point, I knew about FreeBSD, never interacted with the community or um, any aspect of the software in any shape or form. So can anyone tell me what this is? No? Nope. It's the ARM1 processor uh, evaluation board that was going into the BBC Micro. So that's where it all started. So I've kind of gone back a little bit too far. So this is as far as back as I want to go from a history perspective, right? Uh, AR64, uh, what is it? It's a 64-bit um, architecture from ARM, clean slate, ground up uh, design. Um, and this was, this is the future of uh, computing. Um, it's going to power everything. Uh, for the most part, we're getting there. Um, so, as part of the uh, ARM V8 uh, initiative of making sure that software around the world supported the architecture well, um, I was tasked with work with FreeBSD, get, um, get that well supported. Great. How difficult can it be? Partnered up with Cavium. Uh, with their ThunderX platform, um, and we collaborated in funding foundation to work with uh, the community uh, to get uh, ARMv8 support into FreeBSD. Uh, and yeah, we kind of we got there for the most part. Not quite feature parity with Linux, but uh, it was definitely a usable platform. We uh, worked with uh, members in the community, we worked with uh, contract houses to get the work done. It was all great. ThunderX wasn't necessarily the best platform, um, but it, it kind of did the job. Um, so that's all good. Why, why are we spending time, money, effort, manpower in, in doing this? First one is balance. Right? Um, there's no yin without yang. Good, evil, etc. right? Linux, FreeBSD. I'll let people choose which one's good and evil and yin and yang, but that's not my choice, right? Um, so one of the things when we did, uh, when we first came out with ARM v8 was um, making sure that there was a, an even keel there we wanted FreeBSD and Linux uh, to be available to one and all. Um, we also wanted to make sure that the guys and gals in the Linux community didn't get too cocky and too dominant. Right? We wanted to ensure that um, they were kept on their toes, they didn't get all comfortable and go, hey, it's fine, we're the only open source operating system out there, whatever. So we wanted to make sure that FreeBSD was always there as an option. And crucially, choice, right? Um, with the ARMv8 architecture, we had a huge raft of uh, silicon vendors that came out uh, and were providing uh, different implementations. Um, and so to go with the hardware choice, we wanted people to have a choice from a software perspective, right? Um, from middleware, you've already got, you can choose this, that, or the next thing. Operating system, we want people to be able to choose um, 
whatever OS they want. If they want a proprietary one, Merry Christmas, go to Microsoft or whomever. If you wanted an open source platform, well, you've got a choice of two. You can either go Linux or you can go FreeBSD. So that's kind of why we were getting engaged with FreeBSD, et cetera. So how do we use FreeBSD in the arm? Does anyone recognize one of these? Right. Good old fashioned. Um, Network appliance, I believe it's uh, 7, uh, 7340 or something along those lines. It's an old one. Anyway, we're a NetApp customer, right? We've got lots of NetApp devices um, within our infrastructure, and nobody knows. All what they know is their storage. Great. But as we all know, a lot of these NetApp platforms are powered by FreeBSD, so we're a FreeBSD user in that respect. As Brooks mentioned, there's Cherry uh, and Amarello, more to the point. Uh, and for those that don't register the connection, Morello is a type of Cherry. Yeah, we all like the puns. Anyway, so we have quite a few of our uh, Morello uh, architects, etc., actually working on and with FreeBSD, working with the community. This is a photo of Andrew Turner's desk at Cambridge. Um, well, not quite. I think that's a bit tidy, I think. Um, but yeah, so we use FreeBSD. Um, and this may irk um, Gleb and, and John, et cetera, as a bit of a lab kind of thing. Um, reason for that, um, we'll get to in a second, but it's a, it's a great platform for people like us uh, and other uh, commercial entities to work with, right? There's the number of university courses on operating systems built around FreeBSD for a reason, right? It's a great platform to do a lot of research type work, um, to actually get stuff done. So one of the reasons we like working with FreeBSD in that lab scenario is getting code into FreeBSD is pretty easy in comparison to, this is one of the cleaner diagrams of getting your code into the Linux kernel, right? So with FreeBSD, pretty flat. You break it, you fix it. And you'll soon find out if you break it, because somebody's going to shout at you, kick you, until you fix it, which is great. So we use FreeBSD, uh, and when I say we use, we have recently started to use FreeBSD in this manner of, OK, let's, we've got a feature we want to get landed in Linux, in FreeBSD. We're going to go with FreeBSD first. Why? It's easy to get in. Once it's in, we've got a good, solid operating system that we can test stuff on, make sure that this works in theory, in practice, and we can then take that code and take it over to Linux. We can't do it the other way around. Why? The licensing compatibilities. So we love FreeBSD from this perspective, and we're going to be using FreeBSD much more to get more code landed. So the advantage of that is FreeBSD will soon have all the new shiny shiny that we come up with. So if you want the new architectural features coming out of ARM, you need to be using FreeBSD. So what features are coming up uh, and what stuff will you see in that respect? So what Andrew's been quite busy uh, last uh, month or so doing has been Beehive. Um, so a lot of the cool Beehive stuff has now been upstreamed. 
Uh, he's been working on ensuring that uh, our SVE, so scalable vector extension support, has landed so you can get full benefit out of Graviton 3 um, and uh, implement SPE support. Coming up, you're going to have uh, more features for um, SPE. You've got uh, BTI uh, pieces from security perspective. You've got further Graviton 3 feature enablement. Um, and you've got additional SVE, RAS, RNG as part of that. Um, and so moving forward, more um, security enhancements. You're going to have uh, additional uh, vectorization support, SV2. Um, and we've got some stuff that's further down the line uh, in the future. But all of this will be landing roughly uh, in these time frames, in these quarter time frames. And these are kind of geared around um, making sure and with a lot of this stuff, actually, we've become feature parity uh, with Linux. So from a core architectural support perspective, what you get in FreeBSD is exactly what you're going to get in Linux. Right? There's no difference. There's no lag. We are going to be in lockstep moving forward. Um, so if you wonder why Andrew Turner's not responding or seems busy or whatever else, because he is busy. We're making sure he's earning his money. So um, that's all good and well. That's how we're using it. How we're using it, it you know, we've got one full-time engineer. So Mr. Turner is Mr. FreeBSD at ARM at the moment. We have a couple of others that know bits and bobs and can help out. Um, and actually, we find that, uh, so Andrew Turner is part of our core kernel team. That's predominantly Linux kernel engineers. But we actually find that there's a great collaborative uh, environment within the workspace there with our Linux guys, Mr. Turner, and the others that know a bit of BSD here and there, all just talking together. This kind of started in, in the pub. Uh, as I mentioned yesterday, it's how they sort of shoot the breeze, bounce ideas, um, cry on each other's shoulders, you name it. One thing that I would love to see us do um, is grow that team. Um, I'm trying. Uh, I need more customers to be using FreeBSD, more people asking ARM for additional free, FreeBSD features, uh, raising bugs, etc. so that I've got that justification to go to management and say, look, we need more engineers. Um, we're looking at ways that we can actually um, expand our interactions with the community. Uh, how can we be better FreeBSD citizens? Um, moving forward, because we actually value uh, what's happened in the past, uh, and we can see the value moving forward as well. Uh, and personally, I work in open source professionally for the last God knows how long. I do actually like this community quite a lot. Um, some quirks, but I think that's what makes it endearing, right? Um, but why do I want to grow the team? Uh, why do I want more? In involvement for FreeBSD. There's a few things coming down the line. Um, Ampere One's coming up real rapid. Um, NVIDIA with their Grace architecture. Um, so this is not just going to be um, high performance compute stuff. Um, this is going to be standard server based um, CPUs. It's going to be uh, I don't believe it's going to be Grace, but NVIDIA have confirmed that they are entering the laptop market. Um, so you'll be able to get NVIDIA-powered um, laptops, not just from a GPU perspective, but also from the CPU. Qualcomm recently announced their uh, Snapdragon X Elite uh, series. Um, 
AMD have also announced that they're re-entering the ARM market, uh, again, primarily around client-side devices. MediaTek, again, will also be going into the desktop and laptops very shortly. So there's a lot of new stuff that developers can get their hands on. This isn't even talking about what's going on in the IoT space and the embedded space and automotive, et cetera, right? Um, automotive, huge growth there for us. Uh, and so th there's a lot of opportunities there. Unfortunately, it's one segment that FreeBSD is not really well known for. Um, there are a few commercial companies in the automotive space that use quite a few chunks of FreeBSD, but it's not FreeBSD. QNX is an example. Um, they use a lot uh, of components from FreeBSD in their platform. But yeah, so th th there's a lot happening. Uh, we've got the gaming side of things as well, so there's opportunities there. Uh, so I, I really want to make sure that with all this new stuff that's coming down the line, you guys and gals have all the tools available to you to be able to benefit from it, right? Um, so you can just, hopefully, Pavel won't have issues with his laptop uh, rebuilds because it's all done for him, so it's not a problem. Any issues, blame Andrew Turner. It's all good. Um, and so, yeah. That there's, I do have a request, though, as to what can the community here do to help, right? We want to help you help us to help you kind of thing. So we've got um, a new developer program. It's about a year old now. Um, we would love for you guys and gals to join, help participate, make it uh, better. Um, we've also got learning paths, so for uh, documentation and how-tos, et cetera. These are very specific on a variety of different uh, platforms uh, and areas. So that, that's kind of how we're moving forward, and, and these are areas where you, know, you can help contribute uh, very ARM-specific pieces, uh, and that all makes everyone that much better. Uh, and we've got our developer hub as well. Uh, so we're trying to make sure that developer ecosystem have the tools that they need uh, to be able to uh, move forward. So kind of, that's all my slides. I wanted it to be a bit more conversational uh, kind of thing. So that's, you've got the background of how we're doing it, how we want to do things, how we want to move forward. Uh, so, any questions? Um, one of the really cool things about ARM is the fact that you guys uh, maintain tight control over the architecture and when SOC vendors want to use ARM, they basically have to agree to do the whole architecture correctly so we don't have the disaster that MIPS became. That's the, the good side. Um, as I mentioned yesterday, and I think I saw a lot of heads nodding, one of the major barriers we as embedded vendors face is when trying to use any of those SOCs, it's not the arm bits that give us grief, it's all the stuff around it. Um, if you guys could do whatever you can to encourage, require whatever those SOC vendors to either one, document their crap, or B, um, dual license their any drivers that they provide so that they would actually be usable to those of us who don't want to buy into the GPL virus. Um, that would be enormously helpful to the industry. Yeah. Um we are trying to be as politely forceful as we can uh, with uh, our uh, customers and partners. The, when it comes to the driver side of things, uh, it does get trickier, um, but I, I fully hear and understand your pain, uh, and it is something that is pretty high up on our list because 
when we come up with all our architectural designs and ideas and whatever else, we need to test it, right? So we create test platforms for us to fiddle with and, and run code on, make sure. A lot of the time we'll need said vendor's drivers. Uh, and quite often we run into issues and so we try and get that fixed. We do try and push them in the right direction. It's not always easy. Um, and if we've got people like yourselves also going, hang on, this does not work. What do we do kind of thing? It makes things a little bit easier there as well. But yeah. So uh, two questions. So uh, first of all, is uh, ARM going to try to go head to head with, with Intel at the, the high end uh, server space? Um, I wouldn't say we're going to try. I think we've already committed to doing that. Um, so we, as ARM, we're, we're an IP company, right? We don't make anything. We come up with ideas and we license our ideas to other people to do it. So people like Ampere, AWS, Google, Microsoft, they've all committed to doing high performance compute. Uh, and so that's as it is now. I mean, if you, get a, if you go to AWS and you request a, an instance, the default is you get Graviton. The default is you get ARM, right? Uh, and all the cloud vendors are doing that now. Um, I think Microsoft is the last one to come online. Okay, uh, yeah, second question. Um, so 30 years ago, the, the MIPS 64-bit uh, architecture was absolutely the thing. And, you know, we were at, I was at Citrix at the time, I'm sorry, Cisco at the time, and we, uh, you know, we used that to, to great benefit. But of course, it's, it's, Intel has cubic money to, to develop their, uh, shall we say, uh, very complex architecture. So it, it's hard to compete. So uh, bottom line is, is, is if somebody's con committing to an architecture long term, um, you know, what guarantees can, can they have that, that uh, ARM will stay competitive? Um, we, so our history's in the mobile space, right? Even though we started off in BBC Micro, our cash cow has been mobile side of things, right? And we've had various architectures come and go in the mobile space. We've been consistent, right? Um, we are looking at doing exactly the same in all the other uh, vertical markets, whether it be automotive, embedded IoT, server, you name it, right? Um, and the, we've signed a long-term long commitment with the, you know, various um, hardware vendors to ensure that they have longevity. Um, and so we, we, we still adhere to the annual tick from an architectural perspective. Uh, and so we're constantly coming out with new features, listening to the feedback from various hardware vendors, silicon vendors, who then listen to their customers, hopefully. Um, and so our commitment to ensuring that we have that is NVIDIA's not going anywhere. They've just made massive commitment to uh, compute with their Grace architecture. Um, the hyperscalers have signed deals. They're all running ARM now. Doesn't matter whether it's on the east or on the west. Um, they're all there. High performance compute space. Uh, again, we've got new silicon vendors like Cypearl in Europe uh, and others that are, are entering the space. So I certainly hope that I'm able to retire whilst working at ARM. Um, so I've still got a few more years left on me. Uh, and so I, I'm hoping that that continues uh, to be the case. Thank you. I've got a question from Warner Losh from, from Netflix over IRC. So Warner asks, how can we engage with Errata better with ARM? He says, it took me quite a while to get information on the Gig version 3 stuff when I needed to do workarounds for uh, Linux boot. So um, 
we do have a support um, mechanism for uh, getting the errata side of stuff. The, the shortcut would be reach out to me uh, and I can be the, you know, the traffic cop and direct people into the right areas. It's kind of what I'm around for. Um, the, the aspects of getting some of the errata prior to it being published um, can be a bit confidential, whether, you know, things like the whole um, Spectre Meltdown side of things, that's a different set of problems. So we have to wait for all of that, you know, the embargoes and all that sort of stuff to, to happen. And most people are aware of how that kind of thing works. But for, for the regular errata, you can open up a support ticket to get the relevant documentation or come to me uh, and I'll get the right people to, to get you the right docs. Um, our documentation can be overwhelming and a little bit confusing at times, um, but we're, we're, we're getting there and we're coming out with new, new tools and, and ways of being able to, to help work through it. Also then in regards to, to the um, embargo and stuff, is that something that we can work with maybe through the foundation to establish NDAs and yeah. contracts so through? Okay. We, we, we have a valid NDA with the foundation. Oh, okay, okay. So, I was uh, thinking we probably did, but I just wanted to Yeah, no, no we, we, we most certainly have a uh, valid uh, NDA with the foundation and we have worked, uh, Ed and, and Andrew Turner are uh, well plugged into things like, you know, when the, the whole uh, Spectre Meltdown thing came around and, and whatnot. So, yeah, we, we, we are, like I say, we are now at a stage where FreeBSD is going to be in lockstep with Linux, so whatever happens in Linux is going to happen in FreeBSD at exactly the same time. Chances are FreeBSD will be that little bit ahead until the massive uh, people that are working on Linux can then bring it back up in Any other questions? I think Greg's got a question back to ah. ah, sorry. <laughs> for, the, for the stream, Greg was cheering the prospect of FreeBSD being ahead. Okay, well thank you very much, Andy.